You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. Get ready to get muddy and inspired in this episode recorded at the Natural Building Colloquium. Held this year at Quail Springs Permaculture Center in New Koyama, California, the colloquium is a gathering of experienced natural builders who come together to share knowledge, ideas, work on projects, and play in the mud. I started my visit off by speaking with Sasha Rabin, Quail Springs Natural Building Director. So welcome to Quail Springs. We are up in the high desert, a couple hours outside of Santa Barbara, and we're on a community and education site. We run a nonprofit, an educational nonprofit, focusing on natural building and permaculture and kids groups, and we're hosting the Natural Building Colloquium out here right now. And how many years has the colloquium been going on? And for those who don't know, what is a natural building (laughs) colloquium? Um, Yeah, definition of colloquium. I don't really know. (laughs) Um, It's a group, it's a gathering of peers is the idea of it, a sharing of information to make sure, to keep the movement non-competitive and collaborative is really sort of originally how they got started. Um, They've been going for about 22 years. They don't happen every year, but more like every couple years. And it's a gathering of professionals and in people who do a whole variety of different types of natural building um, in, in different capacities. And this one, we sort of focused it on the West Coast. For those who um, are listening and don't know the difference between green building and natural mm. building, there's a big distinction there, correct? There is. And I, um, I'm probably not the best to speak to the clarity on what green building is, but natural building really involves, it's very low tech It's very hard to streamline. A lot of what we build is with the materials that we um, find and harvest from the sites in which we build. A lot of recycled and reclaimed materials as well, um, but a lot of all natural materials. And so I can see how it would be good to define it to regions because each region is going to have different materials. Absolutely, absolutely. And and really different needs too, you know. Our needs building here are really different than the needs of someone building on the Northeast or something, for example. And so what are some of the materials that you've been using for, I think you've been here for, what, about five, seven days? Is it a week long? It's a, it's a six-day workshop, and we're today we're day five. And I shouldn't say workshop. It's a six-day gathering, um, and today's day five. And so we have one project going on called, it's called a feral straw bale, and it's um, designed by two straw bale architects, and they are trying to work on a, a really quick and really cost-effective straw bale prototype building that could essentially kind of replace the, um, that could be used in lieu of a trailer. So something that would be, you know, that you can build for a couple thousand dollars in a couple weeks time and be warm, wind protected, rain protected. So really looking at just simplifying, simplifying a building, a building. The other design element to this project is that all the building materials can be taken down and reused. We have also just been playing with plasters. We have some Tadillac that we've been doing in our bathhouse, which is a fancy sealed Moroccan, um, sealed lime Moroccan technique. And we've been working on some plaster, just plaster experiments, um, as well as a really beautiful cob little courtyard in Rumford Fireplace. And we've been building that just with the sand and clay from our site here. That's so interesting. I can't wait to see them all. We're going to go on a tour, I think, in a little while. And so we're standing right now in a small dwelling. What is this made of? This is is our cold storage, and it's a shipping container that is covered in a couple feet of cob on the south side, insulated. The roof is insulated with straw and clay, and um, yeah, it stays. This is where we store all of our food in the summer, and it stays really, really cool. And you've been at Quail Springs for quite a while now. Uh, yeah, I've been living here for about four and a half years running the natural building program here. And how long have you been a builder? About 15 years. 
And you look like you're about 20. <laughs> when did you start? Wow. <laughs> about twice that. But um, I, star- I was in my mid-20s when I started building. Um, yeah. And it's always been natural building. Yes. I haven't done a lot of conventional building. Yeah. And what's your favorite type of natural building to do? Well, our site here is really conducive to earthen building. We have really great soils here and it's really appropriate for our climate so earthen building playing in the mud basically and so it's basically is that cob and cob adobe earthen plasters yeah how do people decide what to use for their region do you look back to see traditionally what builders used a long time ago and that would give you a hint of what the materials are to use um Yeah, I mean, looking around, really, in so many places, there are little hints of it if you really start paying attention in little museums. And, you know, and then there's different phases, too. You have the, like, for example, around Santa Barbara area, you have, you know, a lot of people talk about the adobe building being really traditional. And it's like, well, maybe the last three three to five hundred years. But then before that, what was being built? And um, so... Yeah, really, really looking around. And a lot of what we do and a lot of what our conversations this week have been about is how to, um, a lot of people who are here in the U.S. going to different places and actually helping share ideas of of, of more, I hate to say um, teaching anything different, but there's a lot of places where people are doing traditional building, but it's no longer needing their needs, needs, the way they're doing it. It's not quite meeting their needs. So then they turn to concrete. So there's also a movement of people from the U.S. who are natural builders going, oh, well, how do I go into Central America and actually teach them that you don't have to use concrete in order to have a nice seal, like nice wall that doesn't dust off or a beautiful earthen floor that isn't going to be too much, you know, really, really dusty. You don't have to use concrete. You can use some of your traditional techniques just altered in this little tiny way. And then that brings us to something that I'm sure people are are interested in is what about codes and building codes and all of that? How do you work with that? That's a really good question too. I um, and I'm possibly not the best one to answer, but we've been working with Ventura County Building Department out here, and um, so some places you can do all of this. To- there's like a lot of places where there's owner builder clauses. There's a lot of building experiments are done just in. For, by using, I'm um, building sheds, building stuff that is under 120 square feet where you don't legally have to get a permit. And there's a lot of innovative um, work being done to work with the permits and with the officials to get this stuff more approved on that level. And then do you foresee that as we move into the future that this type of building will become more and more popular and feasible for people? I think so. I mean, I've already seen it in the 15 years I've been building. It's just like the movement has grown so much that um, I can only imagine that it'll continue in that trajectory. And is natural building a good field for women, would you say? Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Not that there isn't any of the same, you know, there are some of the same issues of... um, Women in the building field has is, is always been a, you know, there's there's going to be challenging elements to it. But as far as a lot of these materials are very, um, very suited to not only women, but also kids and elderly and a lot of variety of people. And there's so many different ways for people to plug in. But I think in general, earthen building in particular really um, is attractive for women to do. And, and women, a lot of women really, really love it. And for you, when you first started, how did you get your confidence to build something? And I would just think if I did it, it might fall apart or something. (laughs) Like, oh my gosh, I'm taking this earthen material. How do you make sure that it's stable and secure? Yeah, well, I did an apprenticeship, and so I learned a lot there. And then I also just built something just for myself. And, And I worked with other builders, and I just saw that, oh, it works. It, Yeah, and it's also, we... We also talk a lot about how some of these materials that people think of as being new materials, but they're actually very ancient. Today, they are put to harder tests than more conventional building materials. If a plaster has one tiny crack, 
people act like it's a huge deal, and really all of us have seen cement slabs with a million cracks and sheetrock walls with cracks, and um, yeah, so that's kind of an interesting that's, yes, that's a good point piece too. Yes, and have na is natural building? I believe it's not, but it's not. So LEED certification is more for the conventional buildings that are going more eco friendly. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And there are some overlap, especially in like colder climates and stuff, where natural where there's an advantage, more of an advantage to natural buildings being. Um, yeah, maybe not so much LEED certified, because that's a whole nother sort of can of worms. But um, yeah. You have to have experience, I believe, to come to this, right? Yeah. So this we try to gear towards people who have some experience. Um, and so there's no teachers or students at this gathering. Um, we're all just here together, um, leading different conversations, doing different presentations, really just sharing information. And I noticed that the schedule was going to be decided the first day, which was interesting. Yes, yeah, so we used open space technology and we spent the first morning creating the schedule for the week. So cool. And what were some of the things that you did this week? Um, so the mornings are mostly conversations and the afternoons are all hands-on projects. And, um, and then the evenings we had different presentations and slideshows and um, more formal like presentation style. And um, yeah, so we had conversations about like networking and how to better share information and uh, different things on teaching. And we just had a little breakout group on what it's like to be a woman in the trade and how to, um, we had a great discussion about how to um, better use our bodies and take care of our, um, our bodies while doing such physical work. Yeah, because this is very physical work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> how many people were here this week? Um, about 60 a lot and are they camping on at quail springs or? yeah most yeah. people are camping i think quail springs has a course coming up right in in april yeah we do yeah. A, um we run a one-week natural building course every april mm -hmm. and i usually co-teach it along with someone else um, usually, um last year was paul swenson and we'll see this year but yeah every every april we run a natural building oh, course and how long is that course it's a week long and what would you learn in the course? You learn about building with earth. And ideally, the goal is that you learn, really understand those materials and that you could then utilize them in a number of different ways. The workshop focuses on cob, which is a building technique that combines clay sediment, sand, and straw. Um, originally from England, it's a traditional um, style of building from England, popularized in the U.S. by Linda and Yanto Evans. And what do you like most about your work? Oh, I love the combination of the creativity and the working with my hands and sculpting and working with people. That's a great combo. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good, com yeah, for me, that's a combination that works really well. And it's it must be so rewarding to see, make, create things that people are using in such an intimate way. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, regardless of whether people even go out and build their own houses, I think that the inspiration that we get and the empowerment that we feel when we have some connection and understanding to building our own houses and just have that feeling that, okay, if I needed to, I could build my own house. Mm -hmm. Which is a, such a good skill to have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you show me what, when we walked yeah. up, you were outside on the outside of this building Absolutely. and what are you doing out there? Absolutely. So we've been working on this, um, this plaster wall here and we ha we're putting on our third coat of plaster and then we're going to carve down through the different colors and layers to some sort of pattern yet to be decided that we will and so we'll, we'll just play with revealing the different colors underneath. And so for people who don't know what about what are plasters? Like so the, what are you using? So the plasters we're using here is different colors of clay mixed with sand and we added some pigment into one of them but mostly it's just um, I drive around and I load buckets of fun colored clay into my truck and then we create wall finishes with it. So you're finding the clay and yeah. harvesting them? One of the, the one of the colors, the yellow came from a canyon to the south of us and the red came from a canyon to the north of us. So you really are collecting natural materials Absolutely. that are in your environment. Yeah. Can you tell me what you what you're doing over here? Let me get closer and then So the other day we created a clay sculpture of a butterfly on this wall and since then, we've been putting thin layers of different colored native clays. And when we're done with that, we're going to start um, carving back through the layers and reveal the different colors through a design on the butterfly. It's beautiful. What's your name and how long have you been doing this? My name is Liz Jondro, and I've been doing... Not this project, but building. <laughs> building. I've been, well, I did carpentry 
way back in my 20s and then I left it for a long time to raise a child and then I came back to it in about 2003 and since then I've been doing all kinds of natural building everything I could get my hands on. Vermont was where I've done a lot of natural building and I work in Central America during the dry season there and our winters here um, training women and youth in rural communities in Nicaragua to do this kind of um, creative work and home improvements and um, better construction. So it's really important work. I think it's extremely important work especially with you know our concerns around climate change and the impact of um, materials and the housing shortage um, using more finite resources is not um, really an option in large parts of the world for economic and environmental reasons and so for women to be able to just make their homes healthier and safer on their own with um, a little bit of resource and lots of raw materials is um, going to make a big difference in mm -hmm, the times yeah. ahead. And that's so empowering for them to have the, the materials there. Yes, they, so they're don't not have dependent, to invest. Right. they don't have to invest money. Um, they just need somebody to invest in them and provide them with the opportunity and the confidence and some of the technical skills and so, even some of the interpersonal skills to learn new ways to work together in community and to support each other in getting improvements together and moving forward together. If someone wants to learn more about your organization, where would they find you? Well, the best place to look is on our website, and it's um, www.nicaraguapuebloproject.org. And as we're talking, you are putting the clay on. Yes, there we go. How thick do you know how to put it? Um, sometimes it kind of finds its own natural um, thickness according to the size of the aggregate, but we're looking for thick enough that when we carve back, we can cut a beveled cut and have it reveal each layer and be thick enough to have a nice, um, a pretty bevel cut. So about an eighth of an inch to a three sixteenths. Wonderful. And you did construction, it sounds like, more carpentry before. I started with yeah. carpentry. And then now natural building. And so do you like the natural building more than the carpentry? <laughs> <laughs> well, in carpentry, you do get to work with wood, which is a natural mater material, but you do end up often working with a whole lot of other materials that aren't natural. So natural building still includes a lot of wood, and it depends what part of the world you're in, whether that timber is actually an abundant resource. <laughs> but no, natural building opens up all kinds of doorways and pathways for people to be involved and express themselves in ways that I didn't find in conventional building, but conventional building can be a great uh, part of your tool belt for sure when even going into natural building. It's good to know how to, you know, cut wood and put together some framing and stuff like that. Yeah, I could see how that would come in handy. Yes. It's really, just looking at even what you're doing right now, it's so much more curvaceous than conventional building, which is more straight line angles. Yes, we work in conventional building often um, with standardized materials that require right angles. And yes, this gives us a lot more creative expression. Love so. that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I can walk over with you to okay, the other great. project. I love your little garden here. Yeah, it's so we're kind of continuing on this garden wall here that gives our vegetables a little protection from the our rough elements here. And your oven. Our wood-fired oven. <laughs> yeah, so tell us what you're doing here. We're creating an outdoor um, gathering space with a fireplace at the center and have built a cob bench that's attached to it out of clay, sand, and straw. And I think folks are doing the final sculpting today so that we can put on a base coat plaster. So can you describe to listeners what this bench, so we see rocks on the bottom. How did you start this and tell us about the process of it? This whole project started before I arrived. There were two cob ovens that got dismantled and the rocks were removed and cleaned and there were adobe bricks that were removed and the cob I think was rehydrated 
and turned back into cob. Um, so we built a simple stone foundation, um, rehydrated the cob, and have been sculpting this bench wow, over really the course gorgeous. of... Yeah, it's nice. I love the little um, mm -hmm. window there. <laughs> the little yeah. portal. It's so cute. And I think that's one of the great things about Cobb is that you can really turn it into whatever you want. It's sculptable, malleable. And how long have you been doing natural building? Oh, um, off and on for seven years. 2009 was my intro. And how did you get introduced? I landed by accident at a small intentional community in southern Oregon where they were building with Cobb. You hadn't been interested in building before? Um, I was interested in building, but I had never heard the term natural building or Cobb. Um, yeah, so that was my intro. And you, did you love it when you started? I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you love most about it? Um, what I love most about it? I love getting dirty. I love that it requires working with other people. Um, and I love how accessible it is. Anyone can do it. And what's your name and where are you based? Uh, my name is Amanda Clemens. I'm currently based in Moab, Utah. And um, mostly doing conventional building at the moment, but occasionally get to work on some fun plaster projects. It was interesting that you could actually take the old cob oven, I think it was, and then rehydrate it and use it again. Yeah. And I'm sure that that will happen again with this bench at some point when it deteriorates or the folks decide they want to shape this space differently. And then how long does cob last usually? Does it how depend? Does like it say last? that you built like a little cob, say you built a cob oven, how long does that stand and, and be functional usually? Well, it depends. Um, it depends. <laughs> Whenever you ask a natural builder anything, that's the answer you'll get. Um, it depends where you are and how it's maintained and whether or not it has a roof on it. Um, I don't know how long this oven has been here, but as you can see, it doesn't have a roof. Um, and it doesn't need one because we're in the desert and they get minimal rain. But how long does a cob oven last, Sasha? Or cob dwellings? Well, I mean, in England, there's cob buildings that are 800 years old. So they can last a very long time. And so cob works in a wet climate. Absolutely, yeah, it works really well with moisture. It dries a lot slower, but it um, it really kind of helps helps mediate ambient moisture in a space. So, because my niece was saying, well, if you build things out of cob and you're using soil, doesn't it when it rains, doesn't it just fall apart? Um, I mean, you could say, well, look at the mountains around us, and they don't just disintegrate in a rain. Um, they say that in like a really wet place that it would be, you know, maybe maybe it eroded about a half an inch in a year. So if you're halfway through building a cob house and you take some time off, it's totally fine. The damage is usually done when there's a break in your roof system and so a whole bunch of water is getting funneled to one area. That's usually when you'll have some sort of more of a um, catastrophic right. mm -hmm. situation. And how does cob, fare, uh, cob uh, buildings fare in earthquakes? We well, we yeah. yeah, we do. Um and that's somewhat that's some of the way that they got started being built was because of some evidence or or just looking at buildings in an earthquake and seeing how much better the monolithic earthen buildings did versus the adobe buildings. Um just like anything like brick doesn't do very well in an earthquake. Um so the um so seeing that the that the monolithic earthen buildings like um, cob did a lot better in, in earthquakes. And what makes cob monolithic? You build, um, you don't dry out bricks first, whereas with adobe you make a similar mixture but you dry bricks in the sun with cob. <laughs> um, you build with your material while it's still in its wet malleable form. I think that there is a myth in our culture that you can build something and it will last forever. And we've kind of forgotten that buildings require maintenance and so Sasha mentioned the cob buildings in England that are hundreds of years old it's not like you can build a cob house and it will stand for hundreds of years it actually requires some maintenance and what is the maintenance on a cob house? Um, 
replastering um, every so often, um, yeah. ensuring that your roof is intact, just general things. That is a really good point because I feel like in modern culture we do expect it to last forever. Yeah, and that's why yeah. you see like houses that are covered in plastic or vinyl. Nobody wants to have to paint anything anymore, and I th I think. I think we really actually need to get back into maintenance. And it seems like with this, the maintenance would be fun. Yeah, it's super fun. And like working together and taking pride in what you're doing. Give me that house in Santa Barbara. Yeah. Wait, where do you live? Uh, British Columbia, Canada. Victoria. Uh, my name's Patrick Henneberry. I have a company called Cobworks out of Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, and uh, we teach cob workshops and natural building and women's carpentry courses. It's about my sixth natural building colloquium that I've come down to. Yes, and so how does cob, does cob differ where in, up in BC where you are from building down here? Because I know people are talking uh, a lot about using what's in your region. The house is designed differently, but it works in the desert and it works up where we are. We get fairly mild winters and it's you know, not unlike where cob originated in Wales and southern England, even less rain where we are. So why it works because we get very mild winters. Can you tell us about, I think you had the first permitted cob house in Canada. Can you tell us about that? I'd been cobbing for a couple of years. I learned from Cobb Cottage Company and Yonto Evans and Linda Smiley and Michael Smith. And I got it, the first one, I got a permit for a studio so it wasn't going to be lived in and uh, the building inspector I gave them copies of the Cobber's Companion of the Straw Bale House and different books on different alternative methods of building and uh, and so they read those so they said they would give me a permit they based it on their trust. They've, I've been building for about 10 or 12 years at that point, and they said that if I was going to be using this new material, it's a thousand years old, that uh, they trusted I would do a really good job. So it was based on trust. So the following year, I said, would you give me a permit to build a, a house? And they said, sure. Before and it went they, from there. And it went from there, yeah. What a great achievement. Well, I, hopefully it paved the way for other people. I know our building inspector got a certain amount of notoriety, and uh, he, he really liked the fame. He was getting emails from all over the States, all over Europe, about what they did to approve this. And they didn't really do anything, but he liked all the attention. <laughs> and what do you like most about working with natural materials and natural building? The people that are attracted to it. It, uh, you can build a fairly inexpensive house. Um, you can learn the skills in a short time. You know, having carpentry skills are really helpful. But you can build, learn the skills for getting the foundation up, doing the floor, doing a heat source, doing the walls, installing the windows in a two-month workshop. And what draw, what drew you to this originally? Him. <laughs> <laughs> the man sitting uh, right next to us. Um, I saw this little tiny ad in the permaculture activist in the early 90s and it just said, learn how to build your home out of mud, P.O. Box 257, Cottage Grove, Oregon. And uh, I thought, oh, I gotta try that. So I started a two year long correspondence with Yonto and I finally, in 97, I took a one week cob works off. And then I realized that I was just made for this. It, uh, I was doing a lot of natural building, using natural materials, building with beech wood and stuff, lumber milled from a small, small sawmill, loosely using local stone. I grew up in a, a small island of 900 people. I lived there for 30 years, raised my family there. And uh, it was a perfect place in, at the time for me to, to learn, to be a builder, to be a carpenter. Can you share with listeners who may not know, what's the major difference between natural building and um, more green or eco-friendly building out of conventional materials? Um, just the garbage pile. There's no, there's no dumpster. 
You're not using paints, you're not using preservatives, you're not using preserved wood, you're not using caulking. You can build an inexpensive house fairly healthy. I did an interview once with the, uh, it was called uh, Realty TV, and I thought it was reality TV at first, and I thought they were going to do a reality show on Cobb. And uh, she had all the questions prepared. And I kind of had the feeling she's going to slip one in there. So her last question was, well, who wouldn't want a cob house? And I said, well, that's easy. Anyone that doesn't care about their health, anyone that doesn't care that has children and stuff, they, they're probably not as concerned. <laughs> Which is true, right? Because you're not using all of those toxic you're materials. using unprocessed material. It's traveled. I mean, this just came from down the arroyo. The bricks are used bricks in the fireplace. So there's, if you ask someone, a contractor, to build you a, a Rumford fireplace, you're probably looking at twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars. You know, and they built it for a few old bricks and lots of people helping. And this is really so it's building community, and you're also really like the eat local movement. This is really build local. It is. It is. You when people come to take a, a workshop they think they're just going to learn how to build a, a house out of mud but it's so much more it's about living community it's about building sustainably it's it's about buying less stuff you know how much stuff do you really need if you spend so much of your life paying off a mortgage so true. and a mortgage comes from the greek word it means death grip that's not a good sign. <laughs> so is there anything else you want to tell listeners around the world? Just just go for it. Get out and do it. You know, get the confidence. What's the worst that can happen? In, in natural building, everything kind of works. God, it looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Hold on, really, the big reveal we've been waiting for. Right. It's a Rumford, which is, this is my first Rumford stove. And... There's a book about it, but there's certain measurements where like the back is half the, the width of the front. Um, and we kind of sort of used that model and then maybe made our own measurements a little bit, but that general shape is where we got the idea. Count Rumford. Gorgeous! Surprise how fast it's drying, it's already. I noticed that the cob has holes like throughout. What is that mm. for? Is that you put those there? Yeah, we did that. Um, and as you're building, if it takes you more than a day or so to do the building, um, it helps it dry and then just like more surface area allows more of the air to dry the surface. And then if you're adding another layer, it's also good to have divots um, so that your wet layer that you add can integrate. So you use your thumbs to push it in. That's what I've been taught. And what's your name? I'm Shannon. Shannon Ray Pritchard. Oh, thanks, Shannon. How long have you been doing natural build? Um, I started doing building about four years ago, and it's been a hybrid of carpentry and natural building. It just happens to be who I've been working with that we've been doing a lot of different methods, and that's how I ended up here is my interests growing towards having built with natural plasters and straw clay as an insulation and, and being inside those homes after they're finished and just feeling amazing in there and, and, and like building houses for other people has become my passion. And how does it feel when you're inside one of those homes? Well, I live in the Northwest on the Olympic Peninsula and the first home I built was in Port Townsend at the Eco Village there and it's for an older couple and the, the weather there can be a really windy, rainy, cold, uh, and in the winter time when you go inside the home that we built with straw clay insulation and then clay plaster on the walls, it, you can't hear the wind, it's well insulated, and uh, the acoustics are really nice too. We sing in there a lot. So. It just feels homey, cozy, like a nice nest, an earth nest. That's what I've experienced being inside. Mm -hmm. It's just peaceful for some reason. The sounds, and, and there's often more rounded edges, we don't feel like we're living in a box. That is something I've learned. If I'm designing my own home, I definitely want there to be more round shapes than straight edges. And it, the light is different, like the way things are reflected inside your home. Mm. And it feels nice. So. Mm. Do you think this needs more water, Patrick? Yeah. But maybe just have a bucket of water with you. Okay. you try that. Otherwise, you can make the whole thing. A little too soupy. What do you think? It's on the edge. 
Yeah, but I think just having a bucket of water and then we'll wet the surface. Well. Yeah. So what are you doing here? It looks fun. Right now we're mixing a base coat plaster to cover this uh, bench and Remford fireplace we just made. And this, uh, this will fill in all the little imperfections and get it ready for a final plaster. Oh, cool. and you're doing this with your feet. Yeah. <laughs> Foot mixing. It's a little bit easier. Good to go, right? Easier on the body and helps the uh, clay bond to the other materials. And it's cooling probably on a hot day. It feels good. <laughs> yeah, it's a little foot spa as well. So what's in this mix here? This is a um, clay slip mixed with sand and chop straw. And what's clay slip? Clay slip is just a uh, clay that's been hydrated and into a really like thick, gooey consistency. So it's got a lot of good, a lot of good stick to it, and uh, the combination between the clay soil and the sand and the straw all makes it uh, not crack. Hopefully, <laughs> how how long do you have to mix it? Um, it's really just until you feel like all the ingredients are integrated properly, and uh, this what we're doing, flipping it over, helps you see what's on the bottom, and just flipping it over. So that was just, it's on a tarp, and the tarp is just pulled, and it gets it all in a big blob. Yeah, it gets what's ever on the bottom on top, and just make sure that there isn't any dry spots, just like making a batch of cookies or bread. So you're kind of kneading the clay. Yeah, yeah, foot kneading. <laughs> you really have to jump yeah. in. <laughs> really fun work. And have you been working on this bench for a few days or yeah. all week? Three, three days. Three days. If you could say your names and then how long you've been doing natural building. I'm Bianca Mondragon and I've been doing natural building for about five years. And what about you? I'm Christina McFarlane and I just got started. <laughs> and what prompt, what made you um, want to get involved? What inspired you? Well, I got my taste for natural building here at Quill Springs. I did a farming and gardening apprenticeship here five years ago. And part of that was had a little bit of natural building involved. And from here, I went on to work with other really amazing natural builders and do more intensive um, natural building workshops and apprenticeships. So, yeah, I just, I really love doing it and it uh, feels really good. It, what have you built? What are some of your favorite things to build? Um, well, I've built a few structures on this property and a couple others. Um, up in uh, the Los Olivos area, and I'm working on one now in northern Arizona. So I, I like to do, I primarily have experience building homes, small homes, and this is the first bench and Rumford fireplace that I've done. I've done benches inside of the homes because most of those homes get furniture built in them, but yeah, this is my first time doing something like this. So the furniture is built into the home kind of as part of it as you're building the home? Yeah, usually because um, these structures tend to be curvier and normal furniture doesn't really fit in them, so <laughs> just uh, build furniture that is permanent and doesn't move around and uh, fits the function of the home better. Oh. And so you build benches or maybe benches, tables? Or... beds, tables, countertops, all of it. Yeah. And what would the countertops and benches be made um, of? There's the a lot of like carpentry involved, mm -hmm. I guess. So the countertops that I've done are just wood that you have, you add in later. Anything else you want to tell listeners around the world about natural building? Living in a in an adobe or cob structure feels really good, and it looks really beautiful, and um, it's really fire resistant. Bugs won't eat it, and it'll last a very long time. Where are we going? <laughs> we're walking over to where we're preparing the clay slip that they're applying. And then, um, can you tell us your name and how are you involved with this building? My name's Bob Tice. I'm an architect. I've been doing straw bale construction since 1991. And it's been a great ride, but it's been a concern for a while that straw bale is, as it becomes more accepted, it becomes more conventional, and as it becomes more conventional, it becomes more expensive and be gets out of reach of the marginal people who actually pioneered straw bale construction. When, when straw bale construction was revived, 
several decades ago. It was actually an invention born of necessity. People just needed something really inexpensive to survive the winter in, like students who needed housing, that kind of thing. So that was the origins of it. And what I wanted to do was spend some time thinking about how with all we've learned over the last three decades, well, two and a half anyway, how we can apply what we've learned to go back and make super cheap construction for people who are squeezed out of the current housing market. So some engineers and I at the last CASBA, California Straw Bale Association gathering, sat down and brainstormed about what would make for a building that didn't have a normal foundation, didn't have a lot of elements of conventional construction so that we could trim the costs, and yet, unlike a double-wide or a tar paper shack, was well insulated and could be improved as your finances allowed. So it's literally a way to get out of the cold and the rain, and then when your next paycheck allowed it, um, add some electricity, put in some plumbing after that, and so on and so forth, which is completely illegal as far as the building code is concerned. But the point is, if we can make this inexpensive enough, people can f attempt at least to fly under the radar and build these things in a friend's backyard, on a piece of vacant land they have some access to, and so on and so forth. And so we had sketched this up, and I sent it to Sasha here at Quail Springs as something that the colloquium might be interested in doing. And as it turns out, they were really eager to get their administrative staff out of this RV. And so they said, yes, let's build one. So here we are. That is fantastic. And it sounds like it's pretty low cost to put up. So what costs are you looking at? This came in at about $3,500 in materials from the ground up. And of course, loads and loads of donated labor. But when you're living on the margins of society, labor is the one asset that you've got available to you. So, true. That is so, so true. something, you know, it would be even better if it were, if it were less labor intensive and and less expensive, for that matter. But the point is, I mean, what you see here was raw ground on Sunday. So all of this has been done in just, and it wasn't Six even days. Not even full work days. They were half work days. So it's more like three days of work got us to this point. And so this is the point, you know, in from what I've learned about construction in the barrios, you know, if you can get a building built before the authorities even arrive, it's like, you know, ownership is half the game or something. And so you've been doing natural, I think you said it oh, quite a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did my first straw bale building in 1991. And if people want to learn more about um, your work and maybe find out more about this type of building, how can they find you? Um, I've got a website, and uh, bob at bobtice.net is my email. Mm -hmm. And so what's your I'm website? Just bobtice.net. Perfect. Thanks, Bob. Anything else you want to tell people about this? Really, It's really a beautiful-looking building at this point. I can't believe it's been three days. The gist of it is, is that it's really technologically simple. And yet it's earthquake safe and it's better insulation than your stud frame house. That's inspiring for people. That's the idea. I mean, and that's the whole idea of Quail Springs. So it was a good marriage. I could see people, like you know how people buy land and then they put a mobile home there? I could see this taking the precisely, place Precisely. Like precisely. The idea is that this can replace a single wide. It can, you know, if you have access to a friend's vacant lot in the city, you can put it there as well. The idea is that it be cheap enough that it's, you know, the price of a used car or something like that so that you're not a slave to the rental market. Which, yes, I know about. <laughs> <laughs> There's another aspect of straw bale construction that might help people find a niche for where they can live, and that is it's a, a incredible ab acoustic properties. So if you can find a piece of land that's been marginalized by being near the railroad tracks or the airport flyway or something like that, you know, this is a perfect place to put something that other, you know, otherwise people probably wouldn't build on it. But straw bale construction does a great job of dampening all the exterior noise.
And how does straw bale construction, is it suited for certain areas, um, certain climates? And We've never found a limit for straw bale construction. We have a few traveling ambassadors in the straw bale network. And my question to them when we meet up is always the same. Have you found a place in the world where straw bale construction was compromised ju just by the ambient moisture? And no. In the rainforests of Washington State, in the swamps of Georgia and Florida, we built just about in every climate in the U.S., including Alaska and Hawaii, and, and so far the straw bale has done just great. That's incredible. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. My name's Brenton Kelly, one of the uh, principals out here at Quail Springs, and, and one of the administrators that gets to enjoy this facility <laughs> once we get it plastered. And you're actually, you were saying you're working on your office right now? Yeah. The straw bale will become the administrative uh, office for Quail Springs. The few of us who push paper work around are currently in the back of an uninsulated mobile home. And uh, this will have a little wood stove and nice windows and doors. And it will be a great conference room, too. I'll probably have a lot of meetings. The future of Quail Springs town and administrative meetings is now stepping into the comfort zone. <laughs> and this, what it makes this building unusual? Well, a number of unusual things. Um, the foundation, it's on a, on a kind of a gravel pad with, with plastic keeping it from the passing water onto the bale so that it's kind of floating on an island. And the, it's load-bearing, so the, the straw bales are holding the roof on, um, not, not any timbers. And then there's some interesting things with the doors and the windows, which we are, haven't exactly gotten to, so I'm not sure what this is going to look like, but they're applied to the outside as opposed to fitting inside a jam. It's a totally different approach, which allows for a great deal of flexibility. And uh, other than that, there's conventional truss roof insulated with loose clay slip straw, conventional metal roofing. But uh, a few things that, that make it, the, the bales are stitched together, uh, somewhat labor intensive, but it saves a lot of material of spiking or compressing or tying in other ways um, and that was an interesting just thing to see. How do they the, do it? Uh, just extra the stitching, corner. yeah, and so the bales are tied end to end, top to bottom, and around the corners. Do you know the square footage of this? Um, the outside is 14 by 16, so it's uh, inside's a little, little under 150 square feet. Thanks, Brenton. All right, thank you, Jill. Hi, I'm Linda Smiley Evans, and I've been involved in natural building for oh, more than 25 years. So, oh, Linda, so you have a long experience with this type of work. How did you first get involved? Well, um, Yanto and I um, were interested in building ourselves a, a house, and we were interested in the indigenous cob construction in the UK. And so we started out to build ourselves a cottage after... Um, a nice bicycle ride um, in the UK looking at indigenous buildings and then one of our dear friends uh, who's an architect for 60 years said whipped out a check for 3,000 pounds and said well go build one in, in the Pacific Northwest and we said okay so um, we did and we um, were the originators of Oregon Cobb construction so I guess I was one of the very first women in the, you know, one of the first women in, in the natural building uh, movement beginning this work. So we went on to uh, building ourselves a house and then went on to build, a, uh, to write a book and then began teaching. And we've been teaching now since the early 80s. And... Um, I guess responsible for uh, a lot of the teachers that are out there now that have gone through our training. So there's just been, um, maybe we've trained maybe 300 w workshops, 10, 10, um, 10 day workshops and longer. So we've done apprenticeship programs. And um, so it's very exciting to be here at the colloquium and see w where the movement has, how it's grown in the 20, uh, 21 years that we, when we started the first natural building colloquium about 21 years ago and just to see how it's evolved is very very 
thrilling and exciting. And how has it changed from that time long ago when you first started? Natural building, would you say? Is it, it's much more popular. Yes, I would say um, it is a livelihood for um, natural builders and there is a ton of women natural builders, which is very, very, very exciting. So the movement is just um, growing so fast and people of all different walks of life are, are interested. We, we focus on the natural builder and training the natural builder to build their own home for a very um, economical or dirt cheap way. <laughs> and tell us a bit about Cobb and just um, describe to listeners who may not know exactly what does it mean if you're going to build a Cobb home? Well, Cobb is a term that came from the UK, which is um, basically Cobb meaning a lump of something. So uh, you could have a Cobb horse that's a little lumpy pony, or you could have a Cobb loaf of bread that's a lump of dough, or you can have a Cobb building, which is um, uh, a lumpy Cobb building, basically. But um, Cobb is a mixture. Well, Oregon Cobb Construction that we started, um, we... um, take the soil from underneath our foundation, the subsoil, and we will add other materials like um, proportions of sand and proportions of straw and water and make a stronger building material. In the <clears throat> original comp building in the UK, they would just dig what's ever out of the earth and whatever comes with it and build with that. But for because we were in the Pacific Northwest in North America and, and not really a large uh, earthen building movement at that time, we wanted to make an even stronger, more convincing building material. Mm-hmm. So we used a lot of curvilinear, curvilinear line and sculpture. Uh, we wrote a book called The Hand Sculpted House. So it's really about um, sculpture and building uh, with your hands and feet, and we teach um, uh, a technique of what we call mud dancing, which involves um, families and communities, and of course you can do tractor cob and mechanical cob, but we really do try to uh, bring in the whole family and community. That's so lovely, and it must be such a rewarding feeling. The person I talked to here today, who I think um, got the first permitted cob house in Vancouver, or in BC, yes. took one of your courses. Yes. So that must feel really good to look around and see how you have pollinated natural building all throughout the world. It's uh, so exciting, and um, we never planned on this. <laughs> it was just we needed a we needed a house, and we built one, and then there was interest, and before you knew it, it just spread like wildfire. <laughs> and why do you think it spread so much? Well, I think it's because um, it was something that was not intimidating. Sculpture is something that um, people could do without any training, really. And so we've developed where we could actually, people taking a 10-day course could actually go away and build themselves a small cup cottage. And we didn't think that was possible, um, but it actually is. And then, you know, the... um, The skills that take more skill, like plumbing and electrical and roofing and things like that, you can find those people to help if you don't have that experience. So it's pretty empowering. Very empowering. And uh, we have have, uh, middle-aged women that are changing their lives in various different ways. I've never built anything before and that can walk away and actually build themselves um, a small cottage. And we do focus on small cottages to learn the craft. Um, first. And so when you put the word out first for a class, how many people came? And Well, when we built our first building, we had a very dear friend that came to visit and she said, well, when are you going to teach? And we said, well, maybe in four years, you know, because everyone tells us it's going to wash away in the rain or whatever. And we want to make sure this works <laughs> because we didn't have any teachers and there weren't any books out. And so we took the little bit of knowledge that was available and tried to create something, Oregon Cobb Construction, that would be appropriate for this day and age. And um, so she convinced us to teach this first course. After many years, we, we decided to do that. And it was a small workshop at first, but after the week-long workshop, our friend and her three-year-old daughter said, well, we're going to go and build our house now. And I said, well, you can't do that with one workshop. And she goes, well, you didn't even have a workshop, nor, nor a teacher, nor any literature. So, you know, so, so that really, 
really took off. And then we started teaching um, workshops all year long. We've trained a lot of other builders and a lot of other teachers and then started the natural building colloquiums and then the colloquiums started spreading and spreading and spreading and 21 years later we're at a, a colloquium where we can see the new generation of builders come in and it's very exciting. And the house you originally built, is it still here? Yes, it is. <laughs> and for listeners who have not seen your book, I have it. It's beautiful. It's. Uh, I look through there and it's just like, oh, I want one of these houses. <laughs> They're like hobbit houses, some of them. Yeah, um, the, and, and I mean that in the best way, yeah, thank the you. magical way. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the book is called The Hand Sculpted House, and uh, we teach people how to uh, take the earth right underneath their feet and sculpt it that blends into the natural environment. So because we're in a forest environment, um, people do come in and say, oh, this feels like a fairy tale land or whatever, and uh, it's because it's the cottages are really blending into the environment real nicely. We do a lot of living roofs and a lot of curvilinear line and sculpture. Wonderful. Tell us um, what you love most about your work. Well, I think um, it's so rewarding to see people feel empowered to build themselves a home um, that they love and love to wake up in every day of their lives and how empowering it is for people to be able to learn that skill. And I think the people that come to us are so incredibly wonderful that that really keeps us wanting to continue. And then for those who are listening and think, well, can I build a home like this? Is it legal to build a home like this? Can you build Cobb homes around the U.S. and around the world? Yes, you can. And um, in British Columbia, there's uh, on Maine Island, Patrick Canterbury has built a lot of um, code permitted buildings because um, they were very cooperative in that way. Um, here, what we do is we, we teach the craft. Um, Cup Cottage Company teaches the craft and then people go out on their own and we can help advise how to work with your building department to build a cottage. We um, have been encouraging students to start off with something they can be inside but is small that they don't actually need a building permit while they're learning the craft. Mm, that so, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. like a, a studio or or um, a greenhouse or, or a children's playhouse or something like that. And then take that as a conversation piece and work with your building department um, from there. We can help um, people do that. And then if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you online? Cupcottage.com. Uh, our website and it has a listing of our um, workshops and trainings and um, how to how to get in touch. Great. And is there anything else you want to say to people that are listening um, around the world? Yes. Go out and build something beautiful and watch the world smile back at you. <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening.